I invite you to grab a Bible and uh, turn with me to uh, the Gospel according to Matthew. Uh, for a, a year now, we've been slowly working our way through the Gospel according to Matthew. We're going to finish out um, in Resurrection Sunday of next year, Easter. Um, and, you know, I've said this a couple times. As we go through, you know, you're forced to take in all of Jesus' teachings. And sometimes you come across ones that warm your heart, make you feel the love. Um, other times you come across teachings of Jesus that are intimidating and kind of terrifying. And then there are other times you come across teachings of Jesus and you're agitated because, uh, because we, you realize that being children of our culture, we don't see eye to eye with Jesus on this one, and we're scandalized by what he has to say. And I think this is one of those. Um, so just, let's just read it, and I won't need to tell you why. You'll see for yourselves. Matthew chapter 19. So when Jesus had finished saying all of these things, that's the teachings on forgiveness and all that stuff from chapter 18, he left Galilee, and he went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan, and large crowds we're following him. That's not news, is it? That's just kind of normal now, the new normal for Jesus, crowds everywhere. And he healed them there. Now some Pharisees came to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then they asked, Well, why did Moses command? that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away then. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. It was not this way from the beginning. I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Then the disciples said to him, Oh, man, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's just, it's just way better to never get married. <laughs> and Jesus replied, You know, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it's been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And then there are those who choose to live like eunuchs, or some of your translations have, who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. <laughs> oh, sheesh. <laughs> um, there you go. There you go. How you guys doing? So let's just count them up. M marriage divorce, remarriage, sex, adultery, gender. Jesus weighs in on some light topics. <laughs> and uh, I, I can already uh, promise you that uh, the talk I'm about to give is inadequate. It's totally inadequate. Um, because these issues are so sensitive. And they're so personal. And they're, they're serious. And they're controversial, right? Can you think of any set of topics that is more controversial right now in our culture other than like gun control? You know, <laughs> really, I'm, I'm quite serious. Like Jesus is weighing in here on issues that are really charged. And they're charged because of our culture and debate. But they're also, these questions matter and I have fear and trembling right now and I never get nervous before sermons, but I totally am right now because, because this isn't just about issues, this is about p people. Like, it's what, what Jesus says here affects every single person in the room. And it also affects people who aren't here in the room and that we really care about and love. And I, I've had the, the strange privilege and wonderful 
experience of reading and reflecting on Matthew 19 that we just read aloud with so many different kinds of people, with, with single people who are straight and wishing they could be married, with single people who are gay and wishing they could be married or planning on getting married. I've, I've read and reflected on this text with couples on the verge of divorce who don't want to be on the verge of the divorce, who uh, I've read this and reflected on this text with people who are looking back on a divorce. These affect issues that are so sensitive and so personal. And they affect people, they affect us, and they affect people that we care about. And so, you know, I'm going to do what I always try and do, right? which is, what is Jesus saying? What did he mean in, in his context, in his time, and in his place? Uh, because especially in issues and passages like this, it's so tempting to make Jesus say what we would like him to say. And, and so let me just predict something right now, what's going to happen in our gathering uh, as we reflect on this together. Some of us are, are going to leave the gathering today and you're going to resonate and agree with what Jesus says. Some of you are going to leave the, the gathering today and you are not going to resonate with Jesus and you're going to disagree. I fully expect that. And, and that's a fruit of something that's intentional on our part, namely that Door of Hope be a community where people all over the map, spiritually or whatever, feel comfortable. And we, we want Door of Hope to be that kind of community because Jesus formed that kind of community around himself. And Jesus was also really clear that he called people to follow him and that following him would challenge every part of our lives, especially in areas where we don't resonate with him. And he still calls us to follow. And so um, I know that uh, this is gonna ruffle feathers. Um, and I just, I'm just gonna, I can't say everything that needs to be said. This, uh, did I already say that? That my talk is already inadequate from the beginning? <laughs> All right, so I just, um, give me grace. And I, just as I've reflected, I'm gonna try and just focus on what I think the heartbeat of this issue is for Jesus. And if we can just focus on that, then I think the implications of this teaching flow out of this and you go into your community groups and your cups of coffee with friends and so on and begin to, to, to fill it out. You guys with me? Okay, let's, uh, let's just dive in and we'll, we'll learn together. Um, so first thing to remember where this teaching fits in, in in the gospel is we're on the road trip. You guys tired of hearing me talk about the road trip? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not tired of the road trip because uh, it's, imp it's important. Every single story in here f fits into that. So back way up in chapter 16, Jesus was way up north, Caesarea Philippi. He set his face to go to Jerusalem because he knows he's going to become king there by dying, by giving up his life. So he's, he just did a pit stop in Galilee around the lake. Capernaum was his home base. And you see, that's how our story began. He left Galilee. He was on the road, took a pit stop, and now he's taking the road down the Jordan Valley on the way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is Washington, D.C., and Hollywood and New York all put together. <laughs> it's the center of everything. And so he a, he's, has a reputation. People know that he's coming. And so leaders, religious leaders, whose power base is in Jerusalem, start sending envoys up to Jesus as he comes on his way. The Pharisees come. And they ask him this question, right? And we're, is their question genuine? No, Matthew's really clear. They came to test him. This is a trap for Jesus. It's a trap. And the question that they ask him, this, this is not a question you would use to trap someone these days. Maybe it is. I don't know. Is it lawful for a, a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Is that a hot topic in our culture right now? That, there's other hot topics, and that's not really one of them. Uh, but it was in their day. It, it was in their day. This, this question was as loaded as asking you know, the presidential candidates about their views on gun control, right, in the Democratic whatever debates that are going to be happening this coming week. So it's that loaded. And when you, when you have a loaded question, it's not just about the question, right? It's about where did that question come from? And why is this a hot topic? And why do they want Jesus to declare what side 
he's on and what's the history of the debate and, and so on. And so t to understand the meaning of this question, we need to look at two Old Testament passages. Then we're going to look at Jesus' answer, which is really the heartbeat, I think, of this whole, this whole teaching of Jesus. Here's what, tracking? Okay. So they're asking him about divorce. So here's something that's interesting. Um, Israel, ancient Israel uh, was given a whole bunch of laws. If you've ever tried a Bible read through in a year, the reason why you always fail in March <laughs> is because you, uh, you, it's the, the story stops after the Exodus and they reach Mount Sinai and God, God starts giving all of these laws to ancient Israel, 613 of them. And they start with the 10, the famous 10 commandments, but then 603 more follow along with more story. And so here's what's interesting. Out of all of those 613 commands given to Israel to set them apart from the nations, only two of them give any guidance whatsoever about divorce. Two. Now that's odd, given that it's a, a pretty important issue right, to human society, too. Here's the first one, Exodus 21. If a man marries a second wife, he must not deprive his first wife of food, clothing, or sex. Um, somehow our English translations are bashful and translate sex as conjugal rights. But there you go. <laughs> That's what it means. If he doesn't provide these things for her, she is free to go without paying back the bride price. Random Bible trivia fact, first divorce law in the Bible. There it is. Um, so first of all, when you come into these laws in the Bible, what you should never do is compare them to modern law. That'll just bad start, right? So God gave these laws to ancient Israel to set them apart from their ancient neighbors. And God, and these laws don't represent God's moral ideal. They represent God working with Israel as he found them after centuries in slavery in Egypt. And after centuries in slavery in Egypt, uh, we find in Israel that practices polygamy, where men could acquire more than one wife. It's a very common practice. It still is in some cultures today, uh, but way more, way more back then. So God finds Israel as a culture that practices polygamy. And so what God does is it's as if and just, so, just think, in ancient culture, it's patriarchal culture practices polygamy, which, um, which gender gets the short end of the stick in that equation? Right? Just give it two seconds of thought. Um, if, if men can acquire li wives like property in that kind of culture, they can discard them like property, and they did. And so God gives this law here to minimize the, the fallout or the damage of polygamous marriages. So that if a husband does acquire a second wife, he, he cannot neglect or abuse or deprive his first wife. Do you see that right there? Are you with me? So just stop and think about this. I know you wouldn't think this the first time that you read through the law, but in the culture of ancient Israel, whose dignity does this law protect? Just say it out loud. Women. <laughs> Women. This wife. This first wife here. So it doesn't jump them ahead to 21st century Western whatever, but that's rather presumptuous to think that God ought to make everybody like Americans, right? So what God does is he works with Israel and he pushes Israel towards a greater principle of wisdom and justice, especially protecting someone who in ancient Israel would have been vulnerable. It's very powerful. And so what's underneath this here? What's underneath this is a view of marriage, that marriage involves a promise, a set of promises or vows, a covenant promise, that these spouses will provide for each other food, clothing, and sex. And if the husband consistently neglects, um, and you can see how very quickly we're on the verge of not just neglect, but abuse in not providing food, clothing, and not having sex with his wife, and so, so what ended this marriage? I think that's the principle here. Who ended the marriage here? The wife's free to go, but did that end the marriage? Is the wife leaving actually breaking the marriage covenant? 
No, what's underneath this is that the husband has broken the marriage vow. He has not done what he said he would do. And in that case, the marriage is broken and the wife is free to go. So the divorce doesn't end the marriage. The divorce is just recognizing what's already happened in reality, namely that the husband has broken his marriage vows. You guys with me here? Because just, we're just explaining the first divorce law in the Bible. Let's look at the second one because it is nowhere near as simple as this, if that were simple, right? <laughs> This is, okay, here we go. I'm just going to read it, and here we go. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds a matter of indecency about her, and if he writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house, and if she leaves his house and becomes the wife of another man, and if her second husband also dislikes her and writes her, a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then, whew, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again. That is one complete sentence. <laughs> um, which is as long and torturous in Hebrew as it is in English, right? So, so what's this law about? Well, what really, this is a law about remarriage, isn't it? it? It just assumes that a divorce has happened, and really it's a law about remarriage, that a husband can't remarry a wife that he divorced if she's already been married and then divorced again. But act, that's not what I want to focus on, because <laughs> that's not what the raging debate in Jesus' day focused on. This, this law right here is precisely the source of the debate that Jesus is being tested on right here. And the source of the debate is that first sentence right there. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him and he finds a matter of indecency, then apparently he can write her a certificate of divorce and divorce her. So the, the million dollar question here is what? Well, what does it mean? that the husband is displeased, and what is this matter of indecency? And welcome to the debate. Welcome to the debate. Uh, the matter of indecency is a strange technical legal phrase in Hebrew that occurs only here in all of ancient Hebrew literature. <laughs> Which means what? Which means it does not have a clear meaning. How do you find out the meanings of words? What do, what do people who write dictionaries do for a living? <laughs> right? They read literature and collect all the places where words occur and then begin to make decisions about the meaning of a word. What do you do if you have an ancient word of a dead language, <laughs> right, and you don't know the meaning of a phrase? Debate. You debate about it. And so the, the raging debate is, and here's the, the two positions, right? So one, one position, and we know this debate has survived in, in literature, Jewish literature from Jesus' day that we have still here today, Jewish literature called the Mishnah and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all this kind of thing. So, but we know that there are two main camps here, and Jesus is being tested as to what camp he belongs in. One camp is connected to uh, a rabbi, a prominent rabbi in Jesus' day named Rabbi Shammai. And Shammai uh, took into consideration Exodus 21, and said that this is referring specifically, the indecency is referring specifically to something about sexual infidelity, about adultery, sleeping, sleeping, you know, getting caught in bed with, with some other man. And that that's what this is, is referring to. And there was another camp connected to a prominent rabbi uh, named Hillel, very famous rabbi, Hillel. There's lots of uh, synagogues and schools named after Rabbi Hillel even still today. And he uh, took a, a view that is called the more lenient or open view. And actually, he took his cue from the word displeasing. And he said, it's anything that doesn't please the husband. And that can refer to a whole host of things. And you can read the list of things that it could refer to. If, you, if your wife bakes dinner or bread and burns it, that's indecent. And that's grounds for divorce, according to the Torah, Rabbi Hillel said. Rabbi Akiba said that if your wife becomes displeasing to your eyes, that's legitimate grounds for divorce. 
So just stop right there. I want you to stop and think through what that means. We're, we're talking about adopting a view that says only men can divorce and initiate divorces, and they can do so for any and every cause. I would just stop and think about the implications of that. Are you tracking? And think about the kind of culture that that would produce. And would it be any surprise to you to know that from all of the Jewish literature and even uh, like divorce documents from Jesus' day that have been dug up by archaeologists, would it surprise you to know which of the two laws became the most popular adopted practice in the Judaism of Jesus' day? Can you guess? Right? That any and every cause view, Rabbi Hillel's view. And so Jesus has grown up the disciples have grown up in a culture where men can divorce their wives for any and every reason, but women cannot do the same. Exodus 21, as far as we can tell, was totally ignored uh, by the Jesus' day in his, in his culture. And so just stop and think about what that means. What that means. And Jesus is being asked, Jesus, where do you weigh in on this debate? And he is so agitated, <laughs> you can tell, because he does what he always does. When he thinks that we are on an adventure and missing the point, what he'll do is he won't even answer the question that he's being asked, and he'll just start in on a thing about what he thinks is the root issue, which is precisely what he does, right? Jesus, what do you think about the hot topic? And Jesus is like, man, man, have you, have you guys ever read your Bibles before? <laughs> He's talking to Bible scholars. Have you guys read your Bible before? Because see, there's this, there's this story on pages one and two of the Bible. When, when Jesus wants to reflect on the meaning of, of marriage and on the meaning act, actually of human existence, where does he go? It's very important as a principle for learning how Jesus thinks about things. If you, if you want to ask Jesus anything about sex or marriage or divorce or gender, as we'll see, where does Jesus go to say, let's start here? He goes to pages one and two of, of the Hebrew scriptures. And so here's, this is really interesting. Here's what he does. He says, listen, listen, if you want to really know how to answer that question, let's go back and, and think about two things. Here's something from page one of the Bible. At the beginning, God made male and female. And said on page two, for this reason a man leaves his mother, mother and father, united to his wife, and the two, the two become one. Okay, we're going to stop. We're going to camp out here. This is, this is ground zero. This is the center of everything. For Jesus, he's not going to engage in endless debates about prohibitions and qualifications. What he's going to do is he's going to camp out and say, according to the kingdom of God, Here's what humans are, and here's what marriage is. And if you get that right, when the controversies come, you will know exactly what view to take and how to follow Jesus because you'll have the right starting point. And so the first thing he does is he quotes from uh, the poem uh, that's the first mention of the image of God in the Bible. Full of Bible trivia this morning, aren't we, right? Where does the first time the image of God idea occurs in the Bible? Jesus quotes from it right here. God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and, and so on. Okay, so let's stop right here. So Jesus, he, he wants to talk about the meaning of marriage, and what he ends up doing is talking about the meaning of human existence, <laughs> what humans are. And so do you see he quotes from the last line of the poem, male and female, he created them. But as always with Jesus, he just assumes that you know your Bible inside out and that the whole poem is going to come to mind. So what's this poem about? This, this poem is about God, God forbid the people of ancient Israel to ever represent God with an image. Right? That's one of the first of the Ten Commands that he gave to Israel. But God, even though he tells Israel not to make an image of himself, God can and does make an image of God's own self. And what is it? 
It's you. <laughs> you. Don't make idols, but God can make an idol of himself, and it's you. It's you. And look at what the poem does, and this is so fascinating that this is the part that Jesus quotes. So how, how many species human are there? Humanity. Human. What's the Hebrew word for human? Some of you are geeks, and you know, because I've told you this so many times over the years. He- Hebrew word for human? Adam, or Adam. Adam. So God made Adam, humanity, in his image. How many Adams are there? Not Adams, but Adams are there on planet Earth. How many species of human? Just one. One. Homo sapiens, modern term for it. So one humanity. And that humanity is made in the image of God. The purpose of this species, that this species has a unique capacity and a unique calling to image God, to reflect God, something about God, out into the creation. And here's, this is, okay, here's the thing. So in the image of God, he created him. Who's the him? Not a male human. It, that him is just a pronoun referring back to humanity. In the image of God, he created humanity. Now here's where the poem goes. The poem says, now there's one humanity, but what what does that one humanity consist of? Two. Two. So male and female. So you have one humanity, but that one humanity consists of two binary opposites, right? Gendered opposites. Now let's just pause right there. I, you could do an endless footnoting and nuancing of that whole conversation, right? Of what is gender, the whole the idea of the spectrum of gender, and, and so on. So Jesus isn't talking about that, and Genesis 1 isn't talking about that. It's just making a broad observation. You look at human species made up of two opposite genders, male and female. Now here's something that's remarkable about humans, is that when the one humanity made up of two, when two of those opposite humans, when they come together and have sex, they make more humans. I hope you're not learning anything right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the second time we'll laugh together. Right? But, so, but are you guys with? Like, that's, do you see how that's what the poem is saying? The one becomes two, becomes one again, and what happens? More humans reproducing. So there's something about the one humanity that is yet two, but when those two become one in a covenant of love and marriage, new life is generated and created. And that is said to be an image of God. That you have one God, but yet somehow this God also has some kind of inner complexity that the story of the Bible is going to play out, and that that inner Being of God is a being full of such covenant love that the overflow of that covenant love between the two distinct pairs generates new life and creation. You tracking? That's the the meaning of this poem. And Jesus cites this poem. He says, if you get this, you'll you'll get the meaning of marriage. And then he, so okay, are humans, however, are humans the only creatures on earth made up of one species, yet two genders that have sex and make more of themselves. Is that unique to humans? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. So what, so what, what about this uniquely images God when humans do it? And that's why Jesus quotes page two. When a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, they become one. The two become one. So here's something that actually is somewhat against nature, you, you could say, is that humans, they could have sex and reproduce all over the place, like rabbits or whatever, right? But humans, the higher human calling that images God is when two of them leave their biological origins and come and form a new family, not just by having sex, but by, by a promise, by a covenant promise promise, and you can fill out Genesis 2 by going to the Proverbs and the Prophets and the Psalm about this vision of marriage as a covenant, where a new family is created simply by the uttering of covenant promises. 
And what are those covenant promises about? Well, think about Exodus 21. It's a covenant promise that I'm going to care for, going to help feed and clothe and have sex with and bind my life and my love and my body to this one person of the opposite gender for the rest of my life. That's what is happening here in Genesis chapter 2. And there's something about that that's unique to humans, that elephants don't quite do this, or, or whatever, ca kangaroos. So there's something, there's something about this monogamous covenant promise that humans make to each other that, that sets them apart. That human, and, and you can just think, think about this from a modern point of view, you know, um, I don't know, some of you don't even care about reading stuff like this, but I get really interested. In this, um, in the new atheist debates and so on, and Richard Dawkins, anybody? Okay, so there you go. So we wrote this book a number of years ago called The Selfish Gene. And what's the point of life here in our universe uh, that has no God from his point of view? And it's very simple for Richard Dawkins. It's to survive. Life is wired to survive so that it can reproduce as much of itself as possible. And in Jesus' vision of the universe, that, that impulse is largely true. But human beings are not just dirt. They're also full of divine breath. Human beings are made with the capacity and the calling to rise above our nature and, and to enter into this unique relationship of a covenant promise of love. And out of that love between a man and a woman, new human beings are generated. And that is an image of God. It's a symbol the lived, breathing image of God's covenant love that also creates, also creates life. And it's against nature to a certain degree. And just think, I mean, just think about this. Of the two genders, um, both of them have a chemical, right? Male and female, both of them have a chemical, but one of the species has a whole lot of this chemical, for the most part, that drives this particular gender to want to reproduce with as many partners as possible. What's the name of this chemical? called testosterone, right? And so, so Richard Dawkins is absolutely right. Like, it, there is a degree of our wiring that is totally about being like rabbits. <laughs> but in Jesus' view, the higher human calling, what makes humans unique and what makes us image God is when we rise above that impulse, we make a covenant promise of lifelong love to one of the opposite gender New humans are created in that context of commitment and promise and love, and that is a symbol of God's own love. And Jesus says that's the point. If you get that, then that will affect your view of everything else regarding sex and divor divorce and remarriage and the definition of marriage. How are you guys doing? That was, I mean, that was like a hyper-dense theology lesson <laughs> right there. But this, I think this matters. This matters because what, what you do in your practice with marriage or divorce or with your definition of marriage is you're assuming some view of what marriage is and you're assuming some view of what humans are when you make a decision about grounds for divorce or what is the definition of marriage. And so Jesus knew that and so that's where he takes the conversation. So, um, I'm so nervous I need my notes right now, <laughs> which like, never happens. <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so for Jesus' view, here's marriage. It's a sacred symbol. It's a sacred symbol whose purpose is to point all of us to God's nature as a being of covenant love. And, and humans uniquely do that in the male plus female covenant and then produces more life and so on. And Jesus says, haven't you read your Bibles? So marriage is something that ideally is a permanent lifelong union that is not meant to be just broken for any and every cause. That's, he comes back into the debate here. And the Pharisees get defensive because they're like, well, of course we read our Bibles, you know, we're Bible scholars. And so do you see, remember their response here? They say, well, why then, Jesus? Since, let's just be honest, this is a debate. Can we go back to Deuteronomy 24 on the screen? So they, they quote from Deuteronomy 24, say, look, Jesus, look at your Bible. You tell us to read the Bible, we'll tell you to read the Bible. <laughs> this is Bible Kung Fu, here, back and forth. They say, listen, Moses commanded divorce. 
In a, if there's a matter of indecency, Moses commanded divorce. And Jesus totally disagrees. He says Moses did not command divorce. He permitted divorce. And that's because these laws in the Torah, you can't just assume when you're reading a law that you're reading God's ideal moral vision for human life. The purpose of the laws is he found Israel as he found them, and he's working with Israel in their ancient context and fallen state to push them towards greater justice. And so, Israel was a culture where divorce happened for all kinds of reasons, and where people could leave without apparently even giving a certificate of divorce. And so Israel was called to have a different process that had a step of writing this certificate, and there had to be a legitimate reason. And so Jesus responds by giving his view on the debate. He gives his view. For Jesus, now that he's stated the basic principle, he's willing to enter into the trap and the debate and so on. And what is Jesus' view about the meaning of the matter of indecency? He just says it. He says it. S sexual immorality. He says it in verse 9. Anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits, commits adultery. How you guys doing? You tracking with how the flow of the conversation went right here? But he says, don't, don't look to this law for God's ideal vision. Go to pages 1 and 2 if you want. That. If you want to know how God works in a bad situation and has to choose a lesser of two evils, then read Deuteronomy 24. If you want to know what humans are for and what, what marriage is, go to pages, go to pages one and two. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> let's pause here because we're at a significant point in this passage. <clears throat> so the, the, this teaching up to this point has really significant implications for if I'm a follower of Jesus, how we deal with and talk about divorce and remarriage and what constitutes grounds for divorce if I'm, a, if I'm a Christian, if I'm a follower of Jesus. And you maybe have had to deal with this personally. We deal with it a lot in a church context, right? When people are having real marriage tensions here in our church community. And so here's, here's the basic. This is very simple, but I'm a fan of boiling it <clears throat> down very simple. <clears throat> Um, there's, two, there's at least two basic views, there's two prominent views about what constitutes grounds for divorce if I'm a follower of Jesus. And one view would be uh, to look at verse 9 right here and say that Jesus said only sexual immorality constitutes grounds for divorce. So a couple's married and one of them goes and sleeps with somebody else, that's a breaking of the marriage vow and that breaks the marriage union. Um, that's a very common view, and what makes this view unique is that nothing else constitutes legitimate grounds for divorce. So if we're talking about a situation of abuse, of uh, verbal or sexual abuse, or neglect or something, um, someone who holds this view would say, yeah, you know, that spouse should probably separate from uh, their, their partner, but they don't have biblical grounds to enact a divorce. You guys familiar with that view? Um, so it's a very common view. Uh, in, in my mind, that view has some severe weaknesses to it, and they're these. Uh, Jesus says this, he gives this statement in verse 9, in the context of a debate about the meaning of a technical Hebrew phrase in Deuteronomy 24. Jesus is not clearly giving a lecture, a complete lecture on divorce and remarriage and what constitutes grounds. Like he's in a hot debate, right? Heated debate, hot debate. He's in a heated debate about the meaning of this phrase in Deuteronomy. So he goes back to pages one and two and then he brings the conversation around and he gives, he gives his view. What does that phrase, a matter of indecency, mean? It means only sexual immorality, which for Jesus means having sex with someone that you are not in a marriage covenant to between a man and a woman. That's what the word means for Jesus in this context. And it's what the word means throughout the rest of, of the New Testament. So Jesus is delivering his view. The question is, well, what did Jesus 
Think about Exodus 21. Well, we don't know because no one ever got into a debate with him about Exodus 21, right? That's the only reason we have him saying anything about Deuteronomy 24, is someone got into a debate with him about the meaning of Deuteronomy 24.1. You guys with me here? So what, what, when Jesus takes the view that the matter of indecency refers only to adultery, who is Jesus standing up for? This is very important. When Jesus takes the view that only adultery is what Deuteronomy 4, 24 is referring to, who is he standing up and defending in that moment? This, this is a crucially important point that is almost always overlooked <laughs> in this whole conversation. Jesus takes the view that he does because he's talking to people who are perpetrating a practice in his mind that is oppressive and distorted, especially towards women. That a man can divorce his wife for any and every cause. And Jesus stands up for every wrongfully divorced and abandoned and abused and neglected woman, and he says Deuteronomy 24 refers only to sexual immorality. That is crucial to see. From our cultural point of view, it sounds like he's being like hyper-conservative or something like that, right? And he is taking the conservative point of view, but he's taking it precisely because this practice was unjust and because this practice was ignoring the other divorce law in the Torah, Exodus chapter 21. So here's what is also is interesting. Exodus 21 is in the Bible, it's in the Torah. Jesus said he didn't come to set aside any of the commands of the Torah. He took a view of Deuteronomy 24 where he stands up to protect the abuse of women. And Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 also quotes Jesus. He uses language from Exodus 21 when he talks about if you're a Christian and your spouse abandons you, what can you do except to accept the divorce? That's legitimate. And so view number two, um, in my view, I could be wrong about this. I don't think I am, but I could be. And I'm, I'm fully open to more conversation debate about this. There's a lot of different views represented even at Door of Hope here. But I think view number two is the most consistent with reading this passage in context and all of the rest of the teachings of Scripture. How are you guys doing? So uh, let's go back to the heartbeat here. The view that Jesus is getting so worked up about here is, is the Pharisees' view. According to the Pharisees, what is the meaning and purpose of marriage? It's to please men. If a man can end a marriage for his wife being displeasing for any and every reason, <laughs> What's the worldview about marriage underneath that? Marriage is an institution that exists to please men. And if the moment that the relationship doesn't please the man, it's over. It's divorce. Jesus has a fundamentally different worldview about the meaning of marriage. Did you see that? For Jesus, the meaning of marriage is it's sacred. It's to provide an image of the covenant love of God, where male and female both reflecting the image of God, come together, they vow covenant promises to each other, and out of that covenant love, new life is, is generated. And Jesus says that, that purpose is compromised by the any cause, any and every cause practice of divorce. Now watch what happens from here. The disciples, what are the disciples' response? They've, this is clearly the first time they've heard Jesus really go into this. <laughs> Because they're utterly surprised, aren't they? They're surprised. They're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, why would anyone get married? And now, now, okay, so we'll laugh. Let's laugh. Ha ha. All right. So, but stop and think, you guys. What, what kind of culture did they grow up in that would generate that response to Jesus' teaching? They've grown up in a culture led by the Pharisees, haven't they? Where marriage is an institution that exists to please men. And all of a sudden, Jesus lays down like, this, yeah, that's totally not like God's vision for what marriage is. And they're scandalized. They've become so immersed in their culture's practice of marriage as, as exists to please and m make people happy. The moment it doesn't make people happy, and they're like, oh, holy cow, like a lifelong? And like you, you work through your difficult issues together even when you don't like each other? And like, no way, right? No way. 
And what is Jesus' response? This is so remarkable. What is Jesus' response? In essence, his response is, you are more right than you realize. In essence. Um, in reality, he starts talking about eunuchs. Oh my gosh, this passage, you guys, right? So eunuchs, all right, here's the last cult cultural thing, all right? So let's just go there. Eunuchs, because I have found from an informal survey, not everyone in our culture even knows what a eunuch is. So a eunuch, we're talking about an ancient practice here. It's very common in ancient world, not so much today, though in some parts of the world it's still a reality. So we're talking about a practice that began with um, kings. In a, in a polygamous culture where kings could take many wives, they would acquire many wives, who are they going to get to be their staffers and servants who work in the castle and stuff like that and look over their property or their harem? Um, male servants. And so to ensure that their male servants wouldn't sleep with any of the king's property, they were castrated. Very common practice. Very, very common practice. So Jesus alludes to the idea of eunuchs. For Jesus, he's, in this teaching, he's using eunuchs as a, as a group of people who will not have sex and who will not get married and who will not reproduce. And so he says, listen, there are eunuchs who are made that way by kings, by, made that way by other people. And, and everyone would be like, yeah, what's your point? Why are you talking about eunuchs right now, Jesus? And then Jesus says this, and this, stop and think about this, and it will floor you just like it did me. Then Jesus says, there are other people who are eunuchs, as a metaphor, so to speak, who are born that way. So some people are born in such a way that they will not have sex, they will not get married, and they will not reproduce. Jesus doesn't speak about this as if it's negative. He just speaks about it like we all, we all know this. So this is the same Jesus who just quoted Genesis 1 that said, humanity, what does humanity consist of? Male and female. But then here's Jesus acknowledging that there are some people who are formed in the womb in such a way that those categories are not so clean and neat. Are you with me here? He acknowledges that. And then the last thing he, he says is the real kicker. He uses eunuch as a metaphor to describe himself. He says there are those who will choose a life of not having sex, of not getting married, and not reproducing. For what purpose? For what purpose? For the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, so here we go. Here we go. And we're back to the heartbeat of this whole thing. Jesus is, is saying there are some, I mean, he's talking about himself, about his own choice to not have sex, to not get married and not reproduce, and why he's doing that. Because for Jesus, the purpose of life is not happiness. The purpose of life is the kingdom of God. And that human beings will fulfill their true purpose when they are so made like God's own character that they are living, breathing images of the loving creator God. And so, for some humans, that will mean getting married. Because marriage, in Jesus' view, is a symbol, right? It's a covenant symbol of the covenant love of God. Man, woman, two separate come together, new life is generated. But in Jesus' mind, is getting married the only way to image the covenant love of God? No. No. And this is, this is a matter of historical fact. Jesus was the first religious teacher that we know of to elevate the role of unmarried single life to be a normal, honorable, significant, meaningful way of life. And early Christianity was the first religious movement that elevated people not getting married as leading exemplary lives. It's, it's just as a fact of the history of religion. That's a fact about Jesus and early Christianity. And, and so here's the rub for us, is that in our culture, to hear Jesus say, to hear Jesus say, you don't need to have sex to have a meaningful life. I mean, you may as well start talking about aliens. You know what I'm saying? Like, that is so off the map of our culture. And I can, I mean, really, I can just, like, we're children of Western culture. You know, I grew up here in Portland. 
I watch the first hours of MTV, like many some of you, I'm dating myself, but you know, I mean, we, we have grown up in the most visually, sexually stimulated generation in the history of the human race. Don't tell me that that hasn't had a huge fundamental effect on our brains and on our view of what sex is. And we have grown up in a culture that has completely separated sex from the act of procreation. So that sex is, it's a commodity, and it's something that I do that feels good. It, and, and in a culture where, where sex is the, the, it is the meaning of life in our culture. Don't tell me that it's not in America, right? There's the prude version that won't talk about the real America, right? And then whatever, that's religious America or something. Then there's the real America that everybody's watching and like participating in. And in that America, sex is the meaning of life. Don't tell me that it's not. And, and then the, the version right below that is, is the version that marriage, right below sex is marriage as the primary path towards happiness and fulfillment in life. And so within our culture, it's completely logical that marriage would be redefined to be separated from gender and that sex would be redefined and separated from the procreation and the creation. Of course it makes sense. What are the fa what's the founding vision of our country? That every person has the liberty to pursue life, liberty, and, and happiness. What is the best thing in life? Sex. What's the best way to be fulfilled as a human being? Being married. Of course. Of course we are where we are today. Like, it's not a surprise. It shouldn't scandalize any of us. And what should scandalize us is that the church in America has almost completely bought into this vision. Maybe not the sex part, but definitely the marriage part. Why is it that in the majority of American churches, single people feel isolated and not included and alone? Because the dominant paradigm is get married and have kids. That's the pathway to a meaningful life. And I, just, to, just to be super clear, I'm really pretty sure that Jesus doesn't share that view. <laughs> He didn't get married, <laughs> right? I mean, just like historical fact number one. Do, do, you, do you think Jesus did not have a meaningful life? Do you think Jesus actually didn't think meaningful life was possible because he didn't have sex and he didn't get married? Like, that's, we laugh at it because all of a sudden we realize it's so ridiculous. He had probably the most meaningful human life that a human has ever had. <laughs> but somehow we don't compute that. And so we, we end up creating churches where people who are not married feel second class and where people who are gay feel even more ostracized because where do they fit, right? And so here, so here we're, we're right to it. In Jesus' view, in Jesus' view, there are multiple ways that a human can image God's love. One of them will be through marriage, which Jesus defines as man, woman, one humanity, gendered opposites coming together to procreate covenant promises, create new humans as the image of the covenant love of God. Outside of that, Jesus envisions a full, meaningful, significant human existence that does not involve having sex or having children, but it does involve a life of covenant love. Oh, absolutely. And actually, it involves a life of covenant love that is, is on a completely different level. Here's the reality. Um, sex feels good. It is not the pathway to ecstasy because sex, sex produces about as much heartbreak as it does ecstasy. And marriage is definitely not a guarantee of happiness or fulfillment. I hope you have enough friends to realize that by now, right? <laughs> right? Or having kids. I mean, here's the thing. Here's what getting married and having kids is a recipe for a whole lot of sleep deprivation, right? <laughs> and a whole lot of investment of your time and your energy and your money. Building a healthy marriage takes an enormous amount of energy and intentionality. And, and, and having kids involves a whole lot of sacrifice. And a, yes, beautiful moments and amazing moments and that are usually five minutes separated from moments of pain and agony. <laughs> are you with me here? This not, marriage is not happiness. 
it is certainly not bliss. We just, we've so idolized these things as a culture, we can't even see straight anymore. What does a life of singleness, whether you're straight, whether you're gay, it doesn't matter. What does a life of singleness dedicated to Jesus lead to? You have enormous amounts of time and resources free now to dedicate to serving others, to loving others in the name of Jesus. And the history of the church is marked by incredible, incredible heroes and heroines of the faith who have done that. And their lives were not diminished in one bit. But somehow we've grown up in a culture that makes that seem ludicrous and second rate. And I, I actually think we're the ones who are not seeing clearly. So here we go. That's what I have to say. That's what I have to say. The implications of this are really significant that we, we can only begin to play out. I don't think Jesus would recognize our culture's uh, divorce for any cause practice. Um, I do think Jesus would recognize divorce as a sad consequence when one of the partners has a hard heart and stubbornly keeps breaking the marriage vows. At some point, it has to stop and the other partner is free. And go read the passages and pray about them, or go read the wonderful book by David Instone Brewer um, that's on the bookshelf. I don't think Jesus uh, would recognize our culture's redefinition of marriage and separating it from gender, and precisely not because he's a bigot. I can't think of a less bigoted person on the planet, right, than Jesus, but here he is. Um, some people say that Jesus never said anything that weighs in on the debate about the definition of marriage in our culture. And I can't, in intellectual integrity, say that's true because he said this, which seems to me to really get to the heart of, of the matter. And so if I'm a follower of Jesus and I sense the high calling to not be married and to give my life, what doesn't, sexual orientation doesn't matter, He's, he's calling me to not have sex with people of the opposite gender or the same gender. It doesn't, he doesn't highlight one as more than the other. He just says sex has its place within the covenant symbol-making of the image of God. It's not the only way to symbol in it, the image of God, but it is that way. <sighs> How are you guys doing? So I'm going to pray, and I, I just want us to hear this. I know that a million conversations just got kick-started right there. And so God bless you as you go into them. Be nice to each other as you go into them. But let's take seriously what Jesus said, and let's take seriously the fact that the same, hear this, that the same Jesus who said this is the same Jesus who said the meaning of human existence is to love God and to love your neighbor. Even that if it includes somebody that you don't like or that you disagree with. And it's the same Jesus who loved every single one of us despite our flaws and our failures, and he gave himself for us. And so with this Jesus, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you're straight, or whether you're gay, there is no shame with this Jesus. In Messiah Jesus, there is no male or female, no slave or free, no Jew or non-Jew, no gay, no straight, just beautiful humans made in the image of God who are deeply flawed and who all need God's grace. And we believe God's grace has come to us freely in the person of Jesus. Amen? It's the good news that we come around together regardless of our disagreements. Let me close in a word of prayer.